son who ever. Here's the point. What we're describing here is a relationship with the local church. It needs to get to the place. Watch this. It needs to get to the place where you can see your brothers and sisters in Christ at the same level of death. Death. The same level of relationship as the next king. Think about this. Because if we were that, we're known by our family values and family oriented, right? That's what we're known for, right? Which, which I'm all, I mean, don't get I got a valley girl, so I, I'm all for those things. I'm not a valley person, but I have become one and I have a valley girl. So I'm all for those things, don't get me wrong. But I just believe that sometimes we make the mistake that when you do not begin with the holiness of God and you see relationship through the filters of the holiness of God, by default, you start worshiping relationships. And right now, some of you have your worth value based on who accepts you, or who loves you, or who rejects you. Some of you have not recovered from previous broken relationships, that right now you are wondering and really battling in your mind how you're going to handle this next chapter that you're trying to embrace. Here's what I'm going to tell you right now. The best way to rehearse relationships and the health of relationships is in the context of the community of believers. I'm a pastor and I gotta sell my product. You have to belong to the body of Christ. Seriously, guys, because the body of Christ is the, is the, is the one entity, is the one, uh, again, group of people that they are driven by the reflection of the holiness of God. That we don't value relationships just because we need one another. We value relationships because our God is trying. Because our God is a trying God that He expresses Himself, He works Himself, He, 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 he operates in the concept of this unity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when we do these things, we're really embracing who God is and how God works. So again, just look at verse 45, and they sold the possession because this is a, again, this is a descriptive. It's telling us what they did. It's not commanded them to do that. So be careful with that. Now, verse 46, quickly. Look at the scriptures. Verse 46. The Bible says this. Every day. Every day. Every day. Verse 46. Every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. And as they continued every day to meet together, they also broke bread in their homes. And as they continued to meet together, they also ate together. And how did they eat together? They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. On your handouts. This issue of them meeting together is literally the concept of one single mind. So, I'm going to say that again. Holiness of God is reflected on how you relate to one another. Now, I need you to picture this. Your relationships at home, your relationships... See, this is why... God, man, I, have, I wish I had time to speak about this. This is why if you are dating singles, if you are dating somebody with a different worldview, Someone who does not embrace the scriptures, you are breaking the holiness of God. You're not just in trouble relationally. Are you following me? Because some of you excuse yourself of this detrimental relationship in the name of I need him. I'm in love with her. You know, she will change eventually. When they were together and they came together, the implication is not that just because they were the same skin color or they spoke the same language or they came from the same religious background, the Bible implies they had one single world view. They have one mind. So here's the implication. Minds and hearts that are intertwined together, knit together, they do it with kingdom priorities in mind, which in my personal view, based on what I read and understand, is the antidote. This is the one single solution to personal agendas. Now think about it for a second. Think about it. Because if you're a firstborn, you know, you're driven and strong-willed, and you're known because, you know, you can just be still, you're always on making things and creating things and all that. I'm glad you're like that. But more than likely, you will end up marrying a middle child, which is exactly the opposite. <laughs> It's going to be very passive, introvert, quiet. Are you following me on that? So here's the deal. I think, I mean, I don't have the, 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 the number, the statistic. I think we just have it by default. We typically attract the opposites on that regard. But here's the beauty of the gospel. When you are either firstborn, middle child, third, fourth, fifth, seventh child, whoever you are in this case, whatever your personality when you encounter the holiness of God, when you understand the relationships are based and built based on the holiness of God versus just personal decisions, personal attractions, then you understand that what brings us together as a church is kingdom mind. So, a couple of months ago, 
I noticed that our ladies from the WMU, which is our latest ministry of the church, they were doing some projects in our church. They were needing some hands. And they looked at their pastor, and they saw that their pastor has no hair. And then they saw the forecast, and they saw that there was some cold weather coming our way. And they looked at their pastor, they looked at their head, no hair, cold front, and they said, Pastor, maybe you should get one of our hats. So I did. Well, they gave me five, actually. So I have matching hats, and it just depends on my outfit. But here's the thing that I want you to understand. What we're describing is the needing of something that produces something good. This is why you belong to a church. This is why you stop criticizing the church. This is why you embrace what Jesus embraced and stop this nonsense of perpetuating your personal agenda. Because your personal agenda is not from the devil. All that I'm saying is that you haven't died for anyone and you have not resurrected from anybody else. So we're just following the guy who pulled out his death in his resurrection. Like if he pulled out his resurrection deal, I'm with you. He probably has something good to, to say to you. You follow me on that? So you haven't done anything. So that's why your agenda and your views, they, they're not the standard. I, I embrace who you are, and I appreciate who you are, but at the end of the day, it's what he said and how he went about it. And right now, I'm telling you, the needing of lives together produces something beautiful. It's called the local church. Stop visiting the church, get committed to the church. Because here's what I know, your soul, look at me, your soul was created for needing. Your soul craves this right here. It craves the entertainment with, and some of you are doing it wrongly because you are doing it on your own understanding. Some of you are going through parenting issues and you have no idea how to embrace your children, how to guide them. And, and here's the deal. You have children who they might have some needs and you want to protect them and they think this is control. I want to be your name. I have no hair. I like this. You know, whatever the case may be. And you're saying, see, we're putting this for your protection. Because if you keep on doing this thing, it's going to hurt you. I've been there, done that. I know exactly where this is going. And your grandma used to tell you, and you keep on refusing these things. So this is why you need to understand this when you hand out. You need to understand that this coming together, this is, this is how you evaluate or you measure whether this is the church for you. Is this church embracing kingdom agenda? Kingdom understanding. Is this church for the holiness of God that is reflected on how they deal with one another? And if this, the answer is no, you need to find another church. You need to find another church. You need to go somewhere else. Because at the end of the day, you can substitute those things. So this is what the Bible says. Let me close up with this. Because here's where, here's where we bring this whole thing into understanding how we do things. The Bible gives you three descriptions that are on your notes. You don't have to write it down. But three descriptions on how they need themselves together. The first one has to do with doing it in the temple. Now, in the temple, all that it means is this, is basically getting instruction, listen, getting instruction to defend the faith. Getting instructed to defend the faith. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you, come on, just think more for a second. This is the place where you get instructed to defend what you stand for. Now, can I be honest with you? I want you to listen to this. When you encounter the holiness of God, and you get into relationships, the specific agenda into the relationships, the needing, the, the, the connecting together. When you come to this deal, I want you to hear this. This basically means warfare against the most powerful creature on the face of humanity after God. His name is Satan. You are in spiritual warfare. In other words, the devil doesn't just want you to get divorced, he wants to kill you. The devil doesn't just want to confuse your children, he wants to kill your children. So, so you're literally embracing this concept of warfare. Now listen to me for a minute. When I'm telling you to be in the temple court, when I'm telling you to gather with these people who are, again, embracing the teaching of the apostles, the scriptures, is so you can defend the faith from you. So you were thinking about your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking about your ex-wife or your husband. I'm talking about defending. See, because, listen, right now, you walk into this place, because she brought you. You don't want to be here right now. She promised you lunch. You're 14, 15, and you don't want to be here. And in your mind, you're arguing with me for the last 25 minutes why what I'm saying is not true, and it doesn't apply to you. You're arguing right now that what I'm saying is not applicable to others, not to you, because if I just knew your story, 
If I just knew where you've been, I would understand what you're doing, what you're doing right now. And you know what? I probably would understand if I knew what you've been in that. But even if I was the case, I'm nobody. My, my, my judgment has nothing to do with this. The scripture tells us that the number one enemy of my needing together, my joy, encounter the holiness, is not Satan, it's literally me. I am the number one threat to my joy, to the experience of the fullness of that. So when I talk about the temple, it's all about this training, teaching, so you can be under the teaching of others for the sake of you pursuing what God wants to pursue. Then he goes into the breaking of bread in their homes. Many people translate this teaching into the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to say this to you on the Lord's Supper. As a church, we practice this on a quarterly basis. It's a schedule. It's on the calendar. But I'm going to say to you this. I don't believe the Bible is concerned on the frequency of practicing the Lord's Supper. I think the Bible is concerned about the heart of those who practice the Lord's Supper. So, so the Bible is trying to be made together with glad and sincere hearts. So I always think of this concept of a rough surface surface and a soft surface. So when it comes to this kind of a, where you're rubbing things, whether it's a rough one, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's a soft one or, or plain, talk about humility. These people came together with a heart that actually pleased the Lord Jesus Christ. I got nothing else to say, believe it or not, to you except to read verse 46, and this is how I'm going to close my team and take my hat off. <laughs> verse 46 closes the whole scenario. When they come in together, praising God together. And at the end of the sermon, Peter closes in verse 47. They were praising God, and they were enjoying the favor of all the people. And because they were praising God, and because they were enjoying the favor of all the people, it is then that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In your handouts, you have one more thing in it. This enjoying the favor of all the people has to do with the concept of acceptance without approval. I explained to you this in the past, and I'm going to say it again. Two eras, two ages, in the concept of Jewish culture, that they said that it was between the era of evil and the era of righteousness. When the Messiah will show up, he split the eras in the middle, and we have this era where evil reigned, and now we have an era of righteousness through Messiah, King Messiah. Well, you and I know that it doesn't work like that. It's an overlapping experience. We know that even though Satan has been defeated on the cross, he still is the Prince of Abraham. Even though Jesus conquered death, he resurrected from the grave, and he is King of kings and Lord of lords, his reign is not completed and fulfilled until he comes again and straightens every single path. Are you following me? So it's a both end verses and Peter 4. Here's what I'm, I'm saying to you. When the Bible describes that they had the favor of the people, is when the church, because of the holiness of God, the church, because of embracing one another in a way that embraces kingdom one versus personal agendas, the church understands now that they have to, when it comes to people, they have to accept people without approving what they do. Think about your family members. Think about those who are in your life, co-workers. God is calling you to embrace them without approving. And guys, listen to me. I don't think you can do this on your own. This is very difficult to do. Because some of you are about to give up in your relationships. Some of you are about to just throw the towel and say, forget it, I cannot carry this anymore. Some of you, some of you because, because you've been violated and abused, you're ready to just to say, no more of this. Here's what I'm going to say to you. The Bible describes that we have to accept people for that approval. And this is why, this is why the Bible brings the understanding that it is the Lord who added this people. Which implies God, through this acceptance with approval, He creates what is called divine appointments. And divine appointments means that this morning there might be someone in your life that they are far away from God and that they need to be encountered with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the implication is this, when you accept this person without approving what they're doing, you are declaring, you are believing that God is at work in the life of this person, whoever it is. 
however far he may feel or sound or be from the presence of God, what you're asking is, God, through the transformation of my heart, allow me to encounter you on what you're already doing in him and just meet you through a divine appointment. Versus you saying, here is far away from God, I am so close to the Lord, I hope that this knucklehead will listen to me and meet me with Jesus. See, you're not the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And Jesus is not limited by people's sin. Are you following me on this? Doesn't limit him. He doesn't approve sin, but he accepts those who practice sin. So right now, if you are in that path of rebellion, if you have never encountered Jesus, this is the moment where you have to understand that your, your behavior doesn't, doesn't define who you are. My argument with homosexuality for many years and today like never before is that if you are a homosexual, if you are a fornicator, singles, you're sleeping around with the opposite sex, married people, if you are an adulterer, if you are having relationship with people outside of marriage or you have had relationship, listen to me. Those things, as simple as they are, they don't define who you are. So you're not believing me. All right, let me explain it to you. In homosexuality, my argument is this. I am okay in a sense of embracing, not approving, that you are telling me that you have a sexual inclination towards same-sex people. I can respect that, I don't agree, but I can respect it. Because in reality, we can have sex with whoever and whenever you want to have sex. Are you following me on that? We're a sexual beings by nature. So, all bets are off. I'm not saying it's right, all that I'm saying is that it doesn't impress me, you being attracted to same-sex person. My argument is this, you wanting to have a relationship with same-sex person, I only accept that if you understand that that inclination is a personal preference. It's not a definition of who you are. Because your sexuality doesn't mean you. Alright, you don't get it. You go. This what I mean by that. I'm a man. I'm a real man. I'm a manly man. <laughs> but if you castrate me, if you take away my sexual organ, does that make me an it? Does that, do, do I stop of being a man? A human being? Because my sexuality doesn't define me. Are you following me on this? My sexuality doesn't define me. The only one who defines me is the person who created me. The only one who defines me is the one who bought me with high price. The only one who tells me who I am. See, again, your sexual inclinations is your business. You're wrong, but it's your business. If you want to go for the same sex deal, just don't tell me and don't try to convince me that's who you are. Because that's not who you are. That's who you think you are. But if you come and meet the one who can tell you who you really are, he'll let you know what you need to do with your life. He'll let you know who you really are. See, some of you are defined by previous relationships. Some of you see, here's my point. The point that I'm trying to describe to you is that God is the one who added these things and He creates those divine appointments. And this is why the Bible says that He added to the church. He only embraces the kingdom agenda. And this is why I need you to understand this morning that when it comes to this experience of divine appointments in your handouts, I left on purpose a blank. This is on your handouts that God added because of divine appointments. Listen to me. You are the vehicle to help people understand that their actions don't define them. That Jesus defined them. But I need you right now. I need you to write the name of the person that you need this week to invite Jesus into their heart by a divine appointment. I don't know if that's a son, that's your husband, that's your wife, that's your parents, grandparents. I don't know who that is in your mind as I speak this morning of divine appointments. Someone in your life has been defined by their past. Someone in your life has been defined by their actions. And I'm just here to tell you that's not who they are. I'm telling you right now, Jesus has an identity for you and I. Because the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, that He added those who were being saved. So, when God adds those who have been saved, is the implication of the last week of that microwave, that He prepares us to be saved into His presence.